Welcome to Marketing Today. I'm your host, Alan Hart, managing partner of Atomic, combining brand science and creative fire. Today on the show, I have Diana O'Brien, CMO of Deloitte. Diana has been chief marketing officer since 2015. Before this, she was on the service side, providing services to clients, and then ultimately leading the Deloitte University before taking on the role of chief marketing officer. Today, we talk about the connection between marketing and sales, how she's driving content and thought leadership, and what her marketing mix looks like. We also discuss Deloitte's aggressive push into the marketing area and how they've been able to do that through acquisition. Well, Diana, welcome to the show. Thanks, Alan. Great to be here. So I wanted to start off um, with the first question around your background. Um, You're now the CMO of Deloitte, but I don't believe your path was necessarily a traditional marketing path. So can you give us a little background on yourself? You are right. I am not a traditional marketer, uh, and the path to be the CMO is quite unexpected uh, for me. I joined the firm in 85 after graduate school, and I spent most of my career actually as a client service professional in the healthcare and life sciences industries. And I still even today really see myself as a client person. Uh, That's how I define myself if I'm in the marketplace. I had a chance to have some roles uh, that were leadership oriented in the client service side of the business. But about seven years ago, I had the opportunity to take on actually some talent development roles. And that was in designing our learning, figuring out what succession ought to be for Deloitte. And that culminated then in me having the chance to be part of Deloitte University. I was the first managing partner there. And that is our campus where uh, all of our professionals come to learn and become leaders, uh, to network and push the edge of who they are. And so I had this chance to really see how our people uh, could thrive. And then through that, we got a new CEO and our new CEO uh, then asked, recognizing she was very savvy into the market and understood the marketing transformation was going on, understood uh, digital and how important that would be to us and, and to our clients. And we didn't have a CMO. And so she reached out and asked me if I would take on that role, which I I did, um, again, not knowing anything about really marketing per se, but understanding our clients. And I think that's actually why she thought it was important and that I would have something to offer to this role as our firm went on the journey. So even though we provide that service, right, we really weren't doing it for ourselves. And so um, I think she she was uh, interested in making sure that we started first with the client and then built an organization around that that would be um, would really drive marketing forward. So that's how I, that's how I got here. Interesting. I love the fact that you started, you know, on the people management or the in the talent management side of the business, and then yeah. moved in, especially with a business that's all about the people. Right? That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, congrats on being named to the top fifty most innovative CMOs by Business Insider. I'm sure, you know, over your course of your career, you've been on you know many lists like that. You know, what what does that mean to you? Well, first, it's an honor. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people on that list who I admire and who I like to follow and hope that I can accomplish some of the things that they've accomplished. Uh, But when I think about it, really, especially given the journey for me here and what we've attempted to accomplish, it's really more about our team, our people. Uh, When I took it on just under two years ago, we, marketing, communications, brand, relationship building, sales, sat in all kinds of organizations and we were these disparate group that we needed to pull together and create one unified group form an internal agency which is one of the things that we did and then align everyone around this vision to be world class because again that was sort of it was embedded in our organization but it wasn't unified in our organization so you know as i said before we go into the marketplace and we serve our clients And we talk about marketing transformation and we help them figure out what to do. But we were maybe the underserved population, if you will, within within Deloitte. And so we agreed as a group of professionals, the whole team, that when we came together, when we uh, combined all these disparate groups, uh, that we were going to 
really push our own limits. We were going to transform ourselves. We needed to redefine even our purpose. We had to re-engage with the talent in all those roles in marketing, communications, brand, et cetera. We had to inspire them to want to be part of Deloitte, right? We had to, we had to invest in new training for them. We had to think about the world that we wanted them to help co-create for us. And so when I think about it, I, I really think about them and I think about what they've accomplished and how they got on the journey and decided to push it forward. And because our CEO is passionate about innovation and understands how important innovation is to every business, every client that we serve, and certainly to our own business, uh, she gave us a lot of freedom to think about how to uh, innovate and do things differently and to challenge the, the status quo of what our particular marketing competencies have been in the past. So maybe before we get even to the next question, I'm curious, maybe first, what does this role of CMO look like inside Deloitte? What, it, what are all the groups or, or functions that, that you're responsible for? You know, I feel so privileged to, I think I own everything that any CMO would, would passionately want to own. So I own everything from our clients and the leaders who have relationship responsibility for those clients and similarly for our markets. So I have responsibility for making sure that our clients get served well and our markets get served well with the actual leaders responsible for them. I have responsibility for eminence, so all of our thought leadership that we put out into the marketplace. I have responsibility for corporate citizenship, for policy, uh, so that we are connecting to the various stakeholders that we have to influence in the marketplace, our own people, as well as uh, legislators uh, and issues that matter to how we might go about serving our clients. And then I have the traditional sort of marketing communications brand elements, but I also have the sales I have the pursuit channel, which for us is really about, again, preparing our people to win work and be in the market. Uh, and then everything we do around client experience all fall within my responsibility. So I, there's not much I don't have that I think uh, uh, any marketer might say, yeah, you, you've got everything you need to be successful. That is an ideal role, I must yeah. say, after having talked to many, many CMOs. Yeah, that's, um, the same, that's the same thing I get when I'm chatting with them, too. They, they yeah. say, gosh, you know, you're so lucky. So right. I really have no excuse not to really accomplish something great. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, so let's talk a little bit about how marketing connects to sales. I mean, you've got kind of a, both purviews in your responsibilities. So how, how do you see the aspects of marketing and what you're trying to drive? How does that play a role in, in creating revenue? For the firm? So I think marketing and sales are completely interconnected. They both play a role in creating the world-class experience that we want our clients to have. Uh, they both need to understand the customer journey and how to make moments matter and what to do to make those moments matter. So that's a really important foundation, I think, for all of us to think about how these two things come together. When you think about the message, right, of what marketing is, it's not just who you are and what you offer, but it has to come to life on the front lines. So marketing and sales and relationship building and all the things that we're asking the people who focus on clients and on markets to do are all about enabling the success story, the win, the uh, opportunity for our clients to better themselves. And so I see them as they just, they play different parts, but what it's sort of forced, at least for me, when I think about it is it's forced a change in the way that marketing and sales play a role across the enterprise. They have to break down the silo. You need a, a new form, if you will, of leadership that is more collaborative. They have to be able to go across the disciplines to solve specific problems, and they have to have the empowerment to do that. Uh, and so they're, they're really interdependent upon one another. And I do think they're, they're about driving growth. And I think that that's what, uh, what really the CMO needs to feel responsible for. Is there, is there anything you could point to that, you know, maybe a quick little example of um, what helps drive that, that integration? I mean, is it, is, it, is it easy as measuring the same things or is it, um, you know, something else that maybe you found that works? Well, there's no question measurement is helpful to it, uh, but I think it's aligning around your purpose. What is it that you're all there to do? 
right? And so for us, that's to make an impact that matters. That's our purpose. And we want to do that for our people, our clients, and in our communities. So for us to be able to do that and everyone to align around that, we have to be able to tell people, what does it look like? How do you do that? So my comment about people needing to understand the critical moments of the customer journey what our clients go through, we have to walk in their shoes. We have to see it from their side. Uh, we have to, to all have that lens and all have that mindset, whether we're face to face with the customer or whether we're creating a digital, uh, interface to the customer, or, you know, we have, you know, we're answering the telephone, whatever any of those possible engagements are, we need to have everyone have that same mindset that I need to start first with the customer in mind and what are their issues and how do I help them and how do I get empathy for what they might be going through? And that's how you get to the problem solving. Right, right. So content and thought leadership, I'm sure, is a big component of what you're doing. How are you driving those things? And kind of what, what do you think other marketers out there could take away from what you've learned? Um, most important here, I'd say, is that, one, I think Deloitte has great thought leadership, but that's table stakes. People, need, you know, we all need great thought leadership. We all need to be uh, looking towards the future, helping and sharing insights that are meaningful to the marketplace. But I do think what's what can be different and what can help uh, people is sort of understanding how to capture the hearts and minds of people, because that's really what the marketers need to do, and and really everyone in the organization needs to do. But to do that, it's it's somewhat challenging, right? You think about today, there's there's such a gap for attention, right? You only have a few seconds to capture it. There, people are inundated with information. They are inundated with public opinion and your key message, it's hard to get out. It's hard to help influence someone. And even if you have the perfect answer, they may or may not listen to you. And so you've got to find ways to meet them where they are. And so we do a couple different things in that regard. We work pretty hard to find multiple platforms to publish on and to use. So we use podcasts, casts just like this, because we think they're a really valuable way to connect. We um, did one of the first massive open online courses that our first topic that, that we tackled was additive manufacturing, and we had over 14,000 people participate from 73 countries. And I think, again, it's just a different, unique forum for getting your information out there to the people that it's relevant to at the time it's relevant to them. Uh, so those are both important ways. We also try to take our assets that we develop, the thought leadership that we have, and make them more interactive, have ways in which we can work together to further its thinking and co-creation of it. Uh, allowing for more feedback into it because we're we're in this 24-7 two-way exchange now and people don't want to be fed something. They want to be part of something. So working on that part of the creation we think is important. Uh, so those are two of the things that we do that I think are how to deliver the important messages that you might have to bring to the to the marketplace. Thinking about your, you know, what role you play and how you can share that. But uh, finding different ecosystems and collaborations to share it with the world. I've always thought about, you know, developing content like you described as kind of a hub and spoke model. I don't know if mm -hmm. this even works, but you've got kind of central platforms, if you will, um, thinking nodes, and then, you know, finding ways to put those out into the world. Is that how you think about it? Or whether it's multiple platforms to communicate that one central node, or um, I'm just curious if you have a mental model for that. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's it's we we have issues that we believe we have we own. We think we really have something to say on, and you know we've got to find all the ways in which they're going to touch the right people at the right time based on how they may connect. Okay, perfect. Well, so you know, moving away from content and just thinking more holistically about your marketing mix that you have today, um, I'm curious what that looks like. I know you've got sponsorships with. The Olympics, you've got content sponsorships with the Wall Street Journal, and you've got your own owned channel, so to speak, Deloitte.com. So maybe give us a little sense of what all are you doing today across your marketing mix? Well, the first thing I'd say is our marketing mix probably um, emphasizes more so than maybe in others, first people. Uh, our people, and the second would be place. Those are those are the two I would argue most important for us, and 
Uh, so the, the first one, just to take people, obviously they're our most valuable asset and everything that I've even shared is, you know, what, when I say even at the beginning of this conversation where I talked about, I wasn't a traditional marketer, but really everything I did was marketing. And part of what we need to do is activate within all of our professionals, right? The 80,000 professionals in the U S and 200,000 outside the U S we need to activate in them a mindset that is, you build trust by building relationships and you do that by being authentic and by showing up and working with your clients uh, as issues arise. Uh, you do it by responding quickly, by being accountable, by showing your best self and helping them to find their best self. So it's about building that culture for our people to feel the freedom to do that so that they all go out and show up at clients with that mindset. So that's the first part of our marketing mix. And the second is more about what you were chatting about, which is sort of place. And again, it ties back to, we need to meet our clients and create that experience for them in a physical world, in a virtual world, you know, on digital and mobile platforms, wherever they may be. And so for us, we've chosen some strategic places to make that come to life that tie back again to our purpose. So our corporate citizenship agenda, for example, puts our people in their communities on issues that matter to us that allow us to live our purpose. So if we are you know, helping in the education area, if we're training principals, as an example, to help you know, be more effective leaders of their schools. That's a way in which we're making, you know, an impact that matters and building a relationship back to the community and ties them back to our purpose. But we're also investing in physical environments to create the kind of experiences people want. So 360 immersive digital physical spaces that bring video and 3D animation and graphics together to help people understand and experience something that allows them to be physically changed as a result of being part of those types of experiences. And then we have things like the sponsorships that you mentioned and other large venues, which we have with the USGA, uh, the uh, USTA, and the USOC. Uh, they both, all three of those, give us a venue to connect and reach clients and create an experience for them, you know, tied to those specific events and helping them to not just enjoy them, but have an experience that allows them to feel what we want people to know about Deloitte and what our experience is. And in all those sort of digital engagements and all those physical environments that we have, both, you know, those that we have inside our, our four walls uh, at Deloitte, maybe Deloitte University or different offices, or those we actually use outside, physical spaces that we use when we create them with our clients. All of those are part of what really differentiates us. And so that's why for us, people in place are the most important part of our marketing mix. So Deloitte, um, over the last few years, has really moved aggressively in the marketing space. And, um, you know, when I was coming out of business school, I interviewed with Deloitte. And honestly, I, I, I didn't see many marketers across the table. Pricing yeah. folks, for sure. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of supply chain and strategy guys and gals. But, uh, and great people. Like, some of my best friends still work at Deloitte. But um, marketing was, was lacking. And... I'm just curious, how do you make a transition like that to add kind of a new capability um, to an existing you know, professional services empire, so to speak? Yeah, well, it's a great it's a great question. And a lot of my best friends work at Deloitte, too. So um, I think that the first thing is just recognizing that it was a strategic decision. It was part of the strategy. It was conscious. We were choosing to do some things over other things. And so we, we did make the decision that we would broaden our capabilities and add to the current ecosystem uh, some important and critical competencies for us to have credibility in the marketplace. And, and so we went on a series of acquisitions to expand our mobile capabilities, digital capabilities, creative capabilities, sensing capabilities all to improve the end-to-end -end story of who we are and how we go about serving clients. Heat was our most recent acquisition, which is a creative uh, agency, strategic investment that really evolved our digital practice and filled a gap that we, that we absolutely did not have. And 
the goal was we had a stake in the ground that said we intend to build a model that really transforms the way that the CMO is going to operate. And it, it, what the reason we picked that was that it married up with the rest of our strategy, which was we want to focus on the C-suite and how they are approaching the digital age. How do we make them really come to life, all of them, in the most successful way? What are the business models that matter? Um, how to be successful in doing that? And, and so that was, it, was, it was a truly conscious choice so that we could become a place that, that you know, we brought the content, we brought the experience, we brought operations, technology, all together so that we could uh, face off against and be equipped to deal with the issues that the CMO faces. And we're curious too, you know, with that much change and, and really kind of bringing those people into the mix, you talked about, you know, your experience leading Deloitte University. Was there a kind of, um, this isn't the right word, but an assimilation process for folks as you're acquiring them to kind of understand the Deloitte model or the Deloitte way? Or yeah. did you, or were you also flexing to kind of meet them where they were as well? Yeah, it's a combination of both. I think the reason you're acquiring them is because they have something you don't have. And the last thing you want to do is organizationally constrain them or take away, you know, put a, put a bureaucracy over them that burdens the the craft and the gift that they're bringing to your organization so it's a really important um, question to honor that but it, it it they have to come into the fold with embracing the spirit of our purpose right which is to make an impact that matters and so for us we feel it's pretty easy actually to move through the mindset shift you know there are certainly cultural dynamics and things that you know working for a firm like Deloitte are different than working from a startup uh, so there are challenges and I don't want to diminish those because people have to work through them hand-to-hand -hand combat to get through them and find ways that that work for the whole organization but if you ground everyone in the customer journey in creating moments that matter in having uh, a mindset that says we are going to make an impact that matters for our clients and for our people. And so then and allowing them to help co-create that, that's, that's, I think, what brings them into the tent so that you, one, don't thwart their capabilities, their, the, the gifts that they bring to the table, but also allow them to align with where you want, where you see Deloitte going. Well, now, stepping back from your role as CMO at Deloitte, I'm curious, just on a personal level, what fuels you? What, what drives you? <laughs> well, I, I hope I sort of touched on it a little bit, but <laughs> I would say that if I, again, this would be for my personal life as well as my work life, it's really the same, that I want to I want to help, and I want to help others find and be their best, their best self, um, whatever that is. And so I like to think of what I do to do that is, is by creating, you know, a space that has in it experiences and environments and the energy so that they can find their best self, so that they're free to be everything that they're capable of being. And, you know, I guess when it's all said and done, I, I hope, you know, some of the people in my life that I've touched would say that about me, that, that I help them to do that. Um, but when I, I purposely think through what is it that I can do to help them to help them to be better, and to, to find their best self. And it's in doing that that I find my own. Um, honestly, I, you know, it's, it's, it's there that I see you know, the glimpses of my best self. Curious as well, what brands or companies or maybe even causes do you think others should be taking notice of? Well, I follow all my clients because that's uh, important for me to help understand them. But I, I would say for me at least, I, I think about that those things I'm I'm sort of personally passionate about are those organizations that challenge the status quo. And they challenge the status quo and they're pushing to evolve, to get better, to improve. So I think that for me, I, I put that in, in the lens. They, they want to make the world a better place. And so I tend to follow those types of organizations. For me personally, um, you know, I, my own organization, that my charity that I had a, a, a small role in helping to create Impact Autism, you know, our focus is to to uh, change the outcomes for adults with autism is something I'm passionate about. And, but, but really there's a number of organizations within, within the disability community that started from a similar grounding. Um, Special Olympics started from a similar grounding of saying, I want to change the status quo and I want to change the mindset that, um, that there are abilities out there that 
um, that won't be able to be realized. And I think, you know, the Special Olympics organization changed that and, and they pushed the, ch they challenged what was the status quo and changed a whole world for, you know, young people with, with disabilities. So it's really those types of organizations that get me excited that I want to, to listen to and follow. And that could be in any realm. It could be in the area of innovation and digital and, um, even medicine, where I think there'll be, you know, some really big step changes to change the outcomes for, for people and, and our world. And that, that excites me. Last question. You know, we've been talking about marketing. Um, you know, what about the future of marketing? And, and you know, what are your thoughts on where marketing is going to head? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I think it's going to be pretty scary and there'll be lots of change. Uh, and I think people can feel overwhelmed and inundated and, you know, crazed by all the things that are coming at them and the new technologies that are there. But I, I would say what's important in, in, in all of that is to not let that get in the way of you and, and your organization's purpose, like what it is that you're really trying to, to bring to life, what's your bigger message, and, and how do you do that? So I would say to, to work to not be distracted by the, 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 over, the, the avalanche of change that's upon us right now. And for me, I'd say, you know, again, focusing on understanding really our customers, so being empathetic, walking in their shoes, seeing it from their angle, understanding how they what they what they're saying to you really listening and hearing what their point is so that you can really understand what they need because they may not be able to articulate that and and then you know sort of doing everything you can to help them you know improve find their best self uh, get greater financial results whatever the outcome is that that you're going for and, and remembering it's still about people it's about the relationship and uh, and not to be overtaken by some of the change. I know when I first took the job, I, I was overwhelmed at first by how much change was happening and the technology that was coming at me. And, you know, I, even in some of our research, we found that it's, while the data associated with social and digital and so forth is, uh, is increasing, uh, organizations aren't really being able to tie that back to results. And what that says to me is that data alone will not make you more effective. You have got to establish an authentic and real relationship. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Alan. It was great being here.